behalf of the board and um, the staff of the Robertson Foundation for Government. I um, also wanted to welcome you all here and thank you all for coming. Um, we've had a, a long and fruitful and productive partnership um, with uh, Syracuse University as one of our five partner schools. For those of you who don't know about us, we fund um, public service leadership development through our five partner schools and we focus on really catalyzing globally minded, globally engaged individuals who we hope will become leaders um, in the federal government. Um, we're excited to have um, Robertson Fellows, other folks from the Syracuse programs that we just mentioned. Also, I think we have some individuals here this evening from the Rosenthal Fellowships, who we partner with, uh, from Plan, who we also partner with, um, and APSIA uh, folks uh, who helped uh, spread the word for us, so, and, and others. Um, so we're very pleased to have all of you here with us this evening. Thank you again also to our, our distinguished um, panelists. Um, this is a timely issue, um, learning about Iran, and uh, obviously our focus for all of us is um, having individuals who really understand um, issues that are going on, critical global challenges, as well as global opportunities um, to be engaged and to be thinking strategically um, about how we interact well in the world. Um, and in particular, diving into deep nuances about things, not just what you necessarily um, here at the top of the headlines, but we've got um, individuals here this evening who have deep, deep um, breadth and experience and expertise um, in Iran um, and that part of the world. So we're thrilled to have them here with us to share their talent and, and expertise and, and insights. So thank you. Without further ado, I'd also like to introduce um, Dr. Michael Schneider, um, who heads the Washington Diplomacy Public, Public, Public Diplomacy, Diplomacy yeah. Program and is also our career advisor for the Robertson Foundation for Government and gives fabulous insight and support and guidance to the Robertson Fellows. So, Thanks. Thank you, Cynthia. It's a, it's a pleasure. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think you can hear me without the mics, all right, but please do, when you have a question, uh, use the mic. It just helps everybody hear better. This is a big room. I don't like it for, for classrooms because, you know, you have to overcome all that distance. I'd much rather have us scrunched in a little bit closer, but we'll make the best of it. Um, it's really a pleasure. It's more, it's an important uh, important discussion for us to have tonight um, on um, the situation with Iran, the bilateral relationship, but, but also the relationship Iran is, is, uh, is going through with the, the uh, other members of the uh, P5 plus one and um, the uh, other stakeholders in the region. We, we have a, quite an agenda to try to get through tonight. We won't have all the answers. Uh, we won't even try to force a conclusion on um, next steps or what should be policy, but we do want to achieve some better understanding of the point of view of each of the stakeholders and the cross pressures within each of the countries, especially in the United States and in Iran, um, that will affect the, the outcomes, the decisions that they make. And we're looking at the next six months. We could look beyond that, but six months is a long time to, to bite off anyway. The, uh, we're really fortunate, to have, as Cynthia said, to have some very accomplished experts here. Uh, Barbara Slavin on my left has, is directing the, Iran, the Future of Iran Project Initiative for the Atlantic Council. Has a long history and experience in the region, in Iran, back and forth, last there, Four years ago. Four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of like the window closing, huh? Mm -hmm. um, and had um, worked as a correspondent, came out of journalism, I guess, mm -hmm. um, for USA Today, Cairo correspondent for The Economist, editor for the New York Times uh, uh, Week in Review. That must have been a challenge. Um, that's because there's so much to put together in, in that, even in a week's time. And um, the, the uh, Future of Iran project is one of the most important ways to stay current with what's happening in the, in the region, in the country. Um, subbing for Reza Marashi is, is Ryan Costello, who's the deputy head of the <coughs> policy office in NIAC, National Iranian American Council, um, which tries to bridge the gap. There's a large, as you know, Iranian American community here, obviously long, deep uh, important stakes from all sides in the relationships and NIAC tries very hard to see where there are possibilities for some kind of, of working together or accommodation. I wouldn't go so far as to say rapprochement, Ryan, but that maybe that's a long term away. 
Yeah, well, long term. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan was a program associate at Connect US Fund, focusing on nuclear non-proliferation policy. So you might have a special interest in the uh, in some of the deadly details of the JCPOA. Hmm? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and we'll add the, we'll throw in the missiles for complexity. <laughs> and has uh, uh, worked with the American foreign policy interests, uh, Array at Daily News, has published in the Courier the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and. INENS, what does INENS stand for, Insights? Uh, it's a nuclear security uh, organization. Great. Yeah. Joyce Karam, to, to Ryan's left, is a, uh, the Washington Bureau Chief representing the National. Uh, it's a, is it a new newspaper? It's uh, fairly new, like 12 years old. Uh -huh. From Abu Dhabi? Yeah, it's based in Abu Dhabi. <coughs> Large English, uh, English English speaking population, public readership. Uh, we get mostly digital. You guys check it out. Free advertisement. The national dot ae. Uh, Ten million of hits a month. That's least. pretty good. Uh, I think so. I think <laughs> so. I mean, it's a lot of work, but we try. Have been with uh, a Hyatt newspaper, uh, International Arabic Daily, based out of London. Um, did you get to Tehran in recent years? Uh, no, I don't think I will anytime soon, but, but no. Uh, Nick Schiffman <laughs> will join us as soon as he can get off Route 395. He is, as you know, the foreign affairs and defense correspondent for PBS NewsHour, won night 2018 Peabody Award, um, has, was the first Al Jazeera uh, foreign correspondent uh, based in Jerusalem. It's been around, Israel. Um, I guess touched base at least a couple times in Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. Um, you can see him at least several times a week these days. Uh, just got back from covering the uh, Trump-Kim <laughs> summit meeting in Singapore. We're all interested in the implications of that for Iran. And we also, of course, have to look at the implications of the rejection of the JCPOA for Korea, how each side will see. Um, it's very plaintive. Is Camille Schick here yet? Well, Camille is also coming, uh, and she is a, uh, a multimedia uh, news producer for BBC and, had, and for the New York Times. And she had a clip on um, the other day where the folks in Tehran were asking, why can't President Trump meet with our leadership? Uh, because uh, he can meet with Kim, we are we are far more democratic. It, it was very plaintive in that. That's why. Of course, it's impossible right now, isn't it, Barbara? So let's start off by giving <coughs> us, if you will, a, a sense of where we are. The, the several stakeholders, particularly Iran, U.S., what the situation is, what we should look out for, and then we'll turn to each of our other commentators for their two cents plain, and then we want to bring everyone into the conversation. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me again. I, I love your program, and it's terrific to have you here in Washington and the belly of the beast, so to speak. Um, well, I think you all know the basics. Uh, President Trump left the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action unilaterally in May. He refused to extend waivers of U.S. Uh, sanctions that were required under the deal. Um, he announced that these sanctions would go back into effect, and there is a period of time. Some go back into effect in August, some in early November. Uh, these are, many of them, secondary sanctions that penalize foreign companies and countries for doing business with Iran um, outside what the United States does with Iran, which, of course, is fairly limited. There, there, were only, there was only one major deal, and that was the sale of Boeing civilian airliners that, that is affected by, by these sanctions. Uh, the international response has been very negative, uh, and European countries in particular are trying to find ways to safeguard some level of business between their companies and Iran, but it's very difficult. Uh, their companies, particularly the larger companies, are much more concerned about their markets in the United States. Uh, we have a $400 trillion a year uh, market, and Iran, uh, I think, is 50 billion. 50 billion, yeah, something like that. So, I mean, there's really no comparison uh, in terms of, of the markets. 
Uh, the Chinese, the Russians, Indians, Turks will also try, I think, to maintain some links. Uh, but it's going to be difficult, and Iran is going to really suffer as a result. The Iranian people are really going to suffer as a result. Um, why did Trump do this? Because he said he would do it. Um, I really think that it, it doesn't go any deeper than that. He didn't really understand the agreement very well during the presidential campaign. He, uh, he described it in ways that had little relation to reality. He complained at one point that American companies were not benefiting enough from it, not even realizing that we've had comprehensive sanctions on Iran uh, since the mid-1990s. Um, he, uh, he said he would, he would get rid of it, and that is his goal. Um, will the rest of the world be able to salvage the agreement? Um, not clear. Uh, I think Iran wants to stay within the deal. It will accept uh, really a minimum of benefits uh, in order to do so. It has to be able to sell some of its oil, uh, and uh, I think that's its main concern, have some sort of financial relationships with, uh, with banks in Europe and in Asia, but even there, uh, if we recall the period of sanctions before the JCPOA was reached, what happened was that Iran sold oil and basically the revenues were frozen in local currency in banks in the countries to which it sold the oil, so uh, in China, in India, in Turkey. Uh, and then after the JCPOA was, was reached, Iran was able to repatriate some of those earnings. It functioned through a kind of barter system. We may see it returning to that, particularly with the Chinese, who are Iran's biggest trading partner, became Iran's biggest trading partner during the period of, of sanctions from 2012 to 2015, when uh, Europe uh, began a major withdrawal from the Iranian market. This doesn't make Iran happy. They'd much rather buy Western products than Chinese products. They'd much rather have Western investment than Chinese investment, particularly in their oil and gas sector. Um, but if that's all that's available to them, that's what they'll take. And I do think they will probably stay within the deal. They've threatened to begin to sort of cheat around the edges. Um, but I think they will stay within it at least through November uh, until they see how stringently this the Trump administration is going to uh, enforce renewed sanctions, and also until they see what happens in our midterm elections, how strong President Trump is. Is he likely to be a one-term president or, or even shorter? They're watching our politics very, very carefully. Um, many of us who support the nuclear deal have urged them to do so, suggesting that Trump uh, may not last for his full term and certainly may not be reelected. Uh, and so they should not throw away an agreement that was the product of uh, over a dozen years of negotiations beginning back in, in 2003 with the Europeans, that they shouldn't get rid of this uh, because of a temporary uh, situation in, in the United States. It's kind of um, ironic. Uh, when the deal f went into effect in 2016, uh, it was not that popular in the United States. Republicans in Congress had done a very effective job of lobbying against it, uh, and uh, it, it, it got through Congress because there weren't 60 votes to block it in the Senate, not because there was an affirmative vote in favor of it. Now, public opinion polls show that a majority of Americans think the United States should have stayed in the agreement. So that is interesting. Um, just a couple of other aspects, I think, for, for me, and, and, and Ryan can speak to this as well. Uh, the real tragedy is that the JCPOA was something the U.S. could have built, built upon to deal with others, other issues of concern with Iran, namely regional interventions. Um, after all, Iran never developed nuclear weapons, and I know we'll talk maybe about North Korea and Iran later, but you know, North Korea has nukes. Iran has proxies, and that has always been the biggest concern, frankly, for the region and for American policymakers. We could have built on the deal to, to talk about these issues. Now the United States has forfeited its seat on something called the Joint Commission, which implements the deal, and we have no direct high-level channels to the Iranians. Um, and, you know, maybe that's the way the Trump administration wants it. Maybe they're their policy now is to encourage destabilization of Iran, weakening of Iran, regime change in Iran, uh, and they think that renewed sanctions is the way to get there. Um, I have my doubts. I think it's just going to make the whole region less stable. 
Uh, but um, so that's basically the situation uh, right now. Um, and we will see uh, how long the JCPOA can last if it's the P4 plus one instead of the P5 plus one behind it. From the uh, standpoint of Iranian public's plan and, and, and the public here concerned about it? Great, yeah. Uh, I think Barbara did a great job uh, providing, you know, an overview of, uh, you know, where we are now. Uh, I agree pretty much with, you know, 99% of that. Um, so I'll just try to add a little bit of color to that. Uh, you know, I think this was a decision uh, from Trump that was made without regard for nonproliferation, uh, for regional security, uh, for dynamics, uh, political dynamics within uh, Iran, and also for U.S. credibility. So, uh, you know, if you're concerned about any of those uh, sort of things, this uh, is going to have a negative backlash uh, kind of across the board. Uh, but kind of stepping back and, and, and thinking about how we got this original uh, nuclear opening with Iran, I think the credit needs to go to the Iranian people who, uh, you know, between 2005 and 2013 were squeezed both by the regime under Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, and, you know, kind of an escalating IRGC role within the economy and, uh, you know, dom domestic sphere. Uh, and then U.S. sanctions, on the other hand. And uh, a lot of people didn't predict uh, that Hassan Rouhani was going to be the one to triumph uh, in the first round of elections in 2013, uh, but he did. The Iranian people came out, uh, overcame the odds, and then uh, made this window uh, to engage Iran possible, gave Rouhani a mandate uh, to pursue a nuclear deal and lift the sanctions. And so you fast forward th after two and a half years of uh, you know, tough negotiations with the Rouhani administration, we got the nuclear deal. The Iranian people were out there you know, celebrating. They wanted a new era. They wanted their country to be treated uh, a little bit more normally, uh, not to be uh, pressed both with, uh, by the regime uh, and by the sanctions. Uh, I think you know the Iranian people uh, wanted uh, you know sanctions relief to be more extensive, and then for moder moderation to cross over into the domestic sphere, and that really didn't happen in the you know couple of first years uh, that was supposed to be full implementation of the JCPOA. So when uh, Trump comes in and he rips up this deal, what he does is he uh, victimizes the Iranian people who wanted uh, sanctions relief, who wanted uh, you know, a more normal relationship with the outside world, and he uh, vindicated all of the Iranian hardliners who said the U.S. can't be trusted, uh, who said uh, that the U.S. will never lift sanctions, uh, and uh, you know, has shifted uh, the pendulum in their direction within Iranian politics. So, um, you know, when you think about, okay, how do we get these 12 goals that uh, Secretary Pompeo has laid out, which is not just the uh, JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, plus additional nuclear concessions, it's also how do we get concessions on ballistic missiles? How do we get Iran to pull back uh, from Syria, from Yemen, and then also to release Americans who are, uh, you know, imprisoned in Iran on, on trumped up charges? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just a wish, wish list. There's no strategy here. And there's no person in Iran who uh, we have a channel with right now that we're able to reach out and affect uh, any of these issues across the board. So right now, I think the, the strategy is just pressure, pressure, pressure. Uh, but there's no, that, that didn't play out between 2005 and 2013. The Iranians didn't cry uncle. What they did was they increased their own leverage. They ramped up their centrifuge program and, uh, you know, <laughs> increased their own bargaining leverage. So, you know, how are the Iranians going to respond? I, I think it's going to be similar to that. They're going to up the ante, whether it's on the region or on the nuclear file. Uh, I do think, you know, it's likely that Rouhani and Zarif want to stay in the deal, as, uh, you know, Barbara laid out. Uh, but I also think we can't discount uh, the possibility that the Iranians will respond in a much more harsh uh, measure than uh, we might expect today. Uh, you know, up until, uh, you know, 2015 or so, uh, there were a lot of folks in D.C. talking about how irrational the Iranians were and, you know, how we can't trust Iran, uh, how we 
you know, they're not going to abide by this deal and so forth. And now you have Secretary Pompeo in his confirmation hearing saying, well, if we walk away from this deal, you know, the Iranians aren't going to race for a bomb or do anything along those uh, means. So there's been a, a, a kind of a shift in narrative here. Uh, and I, I, I do think it's a danger to discount the possibility that Iran says, okay, well, you know, we've dialed back, uh, you know, IRGC naval harassment of U.S. Navy ships in the Persian Gulf. Uh, we've avoided, you know, striking back when there were some opportunities there. So let's, uh, you know, cross those tripwires for conflict that are laid across the region. Uh, so, you know, there is a, a strong possibility, an increasing possibility that uh, we move uh, directly toward conflict. So what we have now is that the calculus is by the end of the year, Iran will have concluded that they're not going to make much progress or enough progress. Um, they're going to be pressured economically. Internal pressures rising. Or is the public in the uh, in the Iranian public more irritated at their own regime, at Donald Trump? Uh, to what extent has the president's decision rallied the public, which is pretty fragmented and, and you know, fractious, um, not unified normally in political terms? To what extent has that consolidated the support for the regime in this case, in this instance? And to what extent, over time, would that support erode? And public get um, a little bit less uh, wieldy. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, Iran is very fractious. I, you know, one of the reasons why uh, Donald Trump can't do a, a Singapore summit with, with Iranians is because there is no one dictator who can speak for, for Iran. Even the supreme leader of the country, so-called, uh, operates through forming a consensus on foreign policy. Uh, and he would not sit down with, with, with Donald Trump, for sure. The president is not the commander-in-chief. So there is no Kim Jong-un-like uh, figure in Iran. It is a kind of quasi-democracy uh, and very, very unruly and fractious, uh, not the sort of place that Trump likes to engage with, frankly. It's not easy for him. Um, in terms of the internal situation, it's very bad. People are extremely unhappy and demoralized. Uh, they're unhappy with their own government. They would like more personal liberty. They certainly uh, want more jobs. The, there were major protests that broke out uh, late last year, and those were mostly over economic grievances. Uh, but there were political grievances mixed in with that as well. Uh, Trump, by withdrawing from the nuclear deal at a time when Iran was in full compliance with it, has in a funny way, uh, I wouldn't say he's consolidated support for the regime because, um, as Ryan pointed out, hardline factions in Iran are now stronger as a result of being able to say, I told you so. And they are working very hard to undermine the Rouhani government, looking toward their next elections in, uh, you know, for parliament and, and for president in 2020 and 2021. And they'll try to take back power and, re and, and put in place a regime like we saw under Ahmadinejad, uh, which I don't think would be good news for anybody, uh, certainly not in Iran and certainly not, not outside. Um, but another possibility is just a lot of instability. And uh, you know, I think that is a goal of the Trump administration, frankly, is to destabilize Iran. Um, this won't help in terms of resolving conflicts in the region. If anything, it'll make it harder. But, um, but this seems to be the goal not just of Trump but, uh, and Pompeo, but of Israel, uh, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, which all have a very uh, anti-Iran uh, agenda um, based on Iran's regional interventions. Um, so it's, it's not a happy picture. And, and uh, you know, I, I came here from a World Cup watching uh, party and, and you know every now and then Iran gets a break so they won last week they didn't win today but they they played very well against Spain and you know they're looking for any opportunity I think just to to celebrate and they let women into their big stadium to watch uh, to watch uh, the game on, on on a jumbo screen and that was a that was a first to have men and, men and women together uh, watching the World Cup one other thing to establish demographics in Iran. The youth bulge is, what, 50%? Youth bulge is fading. It's, um, yeah, they're actually, median age is now a little bit over 30. Well, that's uh, uh, in contrast to the U.S. That, it's very low, actually. 
Yeah, but I mean, it had been in you know twenty something, yeah, uh, yeah. and actually, political scientists and demographers tell us that the older a population gets, the more l unlikely it is to resort to violent uh, regime change or, or revolution. People are a little bit more interested in in uh, in the status quo and in, in stability. So, Iran's you know moment of revolutionary glory may have uh, may have uh, passed uh, at, at least for a while. The concerns that the president had uh, weren't directly in the JCPOA. They were Iran's position in the Middle East, meddling, if you will, in Syria, ties with Hezbollah, uh, the missile development. Uh, these are serious concerns. And I wonder, Joyce, from the vantage of the region, also you mentioned, Barbara, Iran's involvement in the Yemen crisis. What's the region seeing in the situation today? What's the configuration? What's likely to happen in the next six to nine months? H how much time we have are we <laughs> like after midnight? Uh, well, thank you so much, first, for inviting us for the lovely uh, Moby Dick uh, best kebab in town. Um, you know, Iran, uh, we, there is a lot of competition between Iran and the Arab world, but I think they do the better kebab, the better rice, uh, we do the better hummus, tabbouli, kibbe, and baklava. So uh, let's hope for more competition in that and not how it looks now in the region. I, I fully agree with uh, uh, Barbara that it's when you look at Iran in, in the Middle East, uh, I grew up in Lebanon. Uh, I'm from the, uh, they call us the civil war generation and watching that, uh, watching Iranian role uh, in Lebanon, arming uh, Hezbollah, which is now the biggest militant uh, arm uh, for Iran in, in, in the region. You don't, uh, you don't mature, you don't grow to, to have a positive image of the Iranian uh, government. And if you look back at the 80s and then uh, until, until today, this, uh, this trend, this narrative, uh, has only grown more more extreme. Now, of course, Iran is not the only one arming militants in the region, and there are other countries uh, playing the uh, same game. But since we're here discussing uh, Iran, you feel the, I think, after the Syrian war, uh, the, the Iranian policy of uh, uh, helping uh, sectarian organizations have just become so public. Uh, with Hezbollah, with other uh, quote-unquote resistant groups, the narrative in the 80s, in the 90s, is we're helping uh, disaffected uh, Shia. We, we're trying to empower the underdog. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, after Syria, it's, it's uh, on, uh, on a very much large sectarian scale that Hezbollah is involved. Uh, that there are the, the, the Shiism that you're seeing on the ground in Syria, that's now the, I think, the legacy of, uh, of the new uh, Iran in, in the region, and that's very dangerous. Uh, so for the Arab world, for, you know, I, I mean, I don't like to travel much, but I do go to, you know, the Gulf, to, uh, to, to Lebanon, I've been to uh, Syria, it's, the problem was not, uh, was not really ever just Iran's centrifuges or how much uh, the level of enrichment. Yeah. You don't hear that. So the, the one flaw of the nuclear deal, which was great as a nuclear disarmament document, is it never addressed Iran's larger problem in, in the region. Uh, and as, as long as that's left uh, to simmer, as long as the big players are not speaking, and they're definitely not speaking now, as long as you don't have dialogue between Saudi Arabia and Iran, it's, you can just expect more and more uh, instability. Uh, just, I mean, this week, just, I, I can't keep up with a news cycle, it's just, I think Barbara feels the same. We were just in a roller coaster. But you've had Israel bomb Iraqi mm -hmm. uh, militia armed by Iran in Syria. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, we're seeing a push in Yemen by uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia um, against what they call an Iran armed uh, Houthis, trained armed Houthis. Uh, you're, you're seeing uh, there is a debate in Lebanon because the general security okayed Iranians uh, to come in without stamps on their passports. So people think the IRGC now will just walk into the country. But you're seeing just a massive uh, kind of full-scale proxy confrontation happening across the Middle East between this, these big players. And uh, for me, the, the next six months, as well as the, the six months after and the ones after, are uh, very worrisome uh, in the region. Uh, everybody is on edge, and everybody uh, believes that military confrontation is 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 the answer. Uh, I think, you know, when you talk to them, to officials in the region about Trump's decision uh, to withdraw from the deal. I wouldn't say they were terribly excited about it. Some in the Gulf actually saw in that as a good. Uh, nuclear uh, document that's doing its job, but at the, at the same time they've uh, they've come to know this president. They've come to know how to communicate with him, and many know that when you agree with him, when you don't criticize, you can get uh, U.S. support. Uh, and, uh, and Trump, by withdrawing the, from the deal and imposing sanctions right away, I think he, he just lost all wiggle uh, room he has with the Europeans and uh, with the IAEA. So he chose the most drastic path, as with everything else, mm -hmm. just leaving, for example, the uh, UN Human Rights Council. Uh, and that's where, uh, where we are. At the same time, I don't think it's just Trump who is uh, responsible for where we are today in the, in the region. And uh, the Obama administration should also uh, you know, take responsibility at looking the other way, for example, in Syria, for looking the other way in Yemen as well. Uh, so it's not like Trump didn't inherit a bad hand in the Middle East. And talking about bad hands, I mean, Obama came to office with the Iraq war, with the war in Afghanistan. So you're, you're in a sense, just dealing with a set of very bad cards uh, in US foreign policy. And right now, we, we just have no diplomacy in the region. There, there, is, there is none. I mean, there is just pick a location, and we can name you a militia or a war uh, that's happening. And that's very. Uh, yeah, disheartening and uh, uh, concerning. So we can just enjoy the World Cup and yeah. photos of Iranian, you know, the Iranian player that Instagrammed the photo, uh, uh, Instagrammed uh, something uh, just telling the Moroccan player not to feel so bad mm -hmm. about scoring uh, his yeah. own goal. These are the little perks that we can enjoy between the Arab world and Iran because everything else is just, yeah. The dustbin is just on fire. So, yeah. Do you see any uh, possibility of any of the stakeholders in the region being able to do anything toward keeping it from flying apart? It, I think it depends. For example, for uh, I could speak more about Saudi Arabia and UAE. Uh, their ultimate priority is Yemen now, not Syria. So, it depends how things go in Yemen, if they're able to, uh, uh, what do you call it, like shift the tide, uh, if uh, they take uh, Hudaida, what, if they can, if Martin Griffiths, the UN envoy, can, can bring a political agreement with the Houthis, that could just, uh, you know, give us some window for uh, diplomacy. Uh, but they need a win. They, they feel Syria is, is like the narrative if you talk to any Arab and Iranians to their, it doesn't help when you have an Iranian official bragging, we control four Arab capitals in the Arab world. Like, uh, that's really not how you connect with, uh, you know, 
uh, your your neighbor. That was that was public, and that was bound to get a lot of, of uh, irritation, to say the least. Upset in those capitals. Right. So the Arab um, world does not want to be dominated by the Persians, right? Yeah. Right. That's I mean a lot of history, uh, bad history, and uh, animosity on that side. But but yeah, it, it's just if if there is a breakthrough. Uh, in Yemen that could help. Uh, and I have to disagree uh, with Ryan and Barbara. Sometimes the, with the rise of hardliners inside Iran, it might be terrible for uh, Iranian freedoms and Iranian, uh, you know, the social uh, aspect of, of Iranian lives. But regionally, we've seen more dialogue when when, when Ahmadinejad was in power, for example, he went to Saudi. Well, Saudi invited him. Saudi invited him. He was a different king. Right. And now this is just, uh, it's gone. So I don't know where Iran is moving. It feels it's moving more in the hardline direction, even the protests. They're more, uh, I mean, Ahmadinejad, you see him more cheering on protesters <laughs> than yeah. Than, than, than Rouhani, and then they're more in the ruler uh, area, not in the uh, big cities. So it's just interesting and worrisome to watch. Questions? Please. Tell, tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Mara Seeley. I'm a Rosenthal Fellow from Princeton University, and it's really nice to be here. Thank you all so much. I had a question about uh, the demographic uh, comment that you made, and about the aging of the of the youth bulge, and I I understand that you what you said was that there you expect sort of less activism, less um, popular uprising in the future as a result. And I just wanted to ask about the trend of weighthood which we've seen in Iran and this um, the delays in marriage, the delays in kind of entering uh, what's understood to be the the uh, you know the characteristics of adulthood and. You know, we've seen the marriage rate plummet. We've seen it get delayed into the 30s to the extent where the state has gotten involved. And I'm wondering whether kind of the age window at which people are willing to put things on the line, where they have less at stake, where they'll protest, is maybe getting pushed back. I'm just wondering what you would comment on that. Interesting. I mean, most of the demonstrators, the protesters, in uh, the end of last year, beginning of this year, were in their 20s or even younger. Um, they were they were kids who had not demonstrated in 2009 when Iran had its last big uh, protests, um, and you know their their older brothers and sisters did not, by and large, take take part in 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 the protests. There's some interesting work that's been done on on sort of uh, demography and and political change, and it seems to suggest that once the um, the median age goes above 30 that societies are less prone to sort of violent upheaval. Um, and, and uh, you know, when Iran had its revolution in 1979, the population was very young. Uh, and uh, it, it, so people think there is perhaps uh, something there. Um, people are very focused on their economic well-being, whether they have jobs or not. I think that's still key. You're right about people postponing marriage. The birth rate went way down, in part because women became better educated. Uh, but also because they got married later. And uh, there are a lot of Iranians now who live together without getting married. Um, it's, I, you know, it's called the Islamic Republic of Iran, but it's one of the least religious places I've visited in, in the world, and certainly in the Middle East. I would say it is the most secular society in the Middle East, which is what happens to you when you try to shove religion down people's throats for 40 years. It's quite, quite interesting. Um, so I, I think they're going to muddle through. You know, uh, people try to leave. The diaspora will get bigger. Uh, Iranians who have advanced degrees, who are proficient, particularly in STEM, uh, they used to come to the United States. Now they'll go to Britain and France and Australia, Canada, uh, you know, Germany, um, and uh, they'll leave behind just a, you know, a kind of unhappy. Uh, an unhappy country that thought it had a shot at reintegrating with the international community and now is seeing those hopes kind of uh, vanish at least while Trump is president. Sir, please. 
um, Stanley Kober. Um, I'd like to ask about the relationship between Russia and Iran in particular. Um, recently, I'm picking up some indications of some growing tension. The, okay, and Barbara's nodding. So maybe I don't even have to continue with the question. Perhaps you can address it, because I don't think that's getting a lot of attention. Sure. Um, and if you want to, uh, over I, Syria I, or... Maybe you, I will disagree, but... Uh... No, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. I mean, Iran and Russia are not, you know, natural friends. I mean, the, you know, Russian Empire uh, took bits right. of the Persian Empire. There, there's a history. And there's a history there. And even during World War II, the Soviet Union occupied part of Iran uh, uh, for some years until they were, they were pushed out. So... Um, they don't love each other, let's put it that way, but they have an alliance of convenience in Syria. Both were, have been very strong backers of the Assad regime. Um, and uh, the Russians also have been helpful to Iran in terms of weapons, in terms of the nuclear program. They completed Iran's only civilian nuclear reactors at Bushir. They were started by the Germans, and after the revolution, the Germans left, and eventually the Russians came in and finished finish the, the, the projects. So um, they're kind of thrown together. But you do see cracks, particularly in Syria. Um, the Russians do not want uh, to see the Israelis get more involved in Syria, and they certainly don't want open clashes uh, between um, either the Assad regime in Israel or the Iranians and the Iranian-backed groups in Israel. And uh, Bibi Netanyahu has been going to Russia every four or five weeks to talk to Putin about the situation. And they try to reach understandings. Uh, the Iranians complain, basically, that the Russians have double-crossed them and allowed Israel to attack uh, uh, Iranian-backed uh, forces and bases in Syria with impunity. And there have been a number of attacks, and scores of Iranians and Iranian-backed uh, proxies have been killed in Syria. Um, there was also an Israeli plane that got shot down. Yeah. Um, it, it, it fell in Israel proper, fortunately. Otherwise, I think the Israelis would have invaded. You know, the pilot was able to eject, eject yeah. Uh, but it's tense. It's very tense. And the United States is sort of taking a back seat, but every now and then we, you know, the United States will hit a, an ISIS target or some other target. Everything is very, on the U.S. side, is very covert and murky. Uh, so we don't see it, but there's still, I think, several thousand American troops in, in Syria, and there are, what, about 5,000 in Iraq? Um, 5,000, 6,000? Yeah, yeah. yeah 5,000, 6,000 in Iraq. So there's still a U.S. presence. Trump says he wants to pull all those people back, um, but the Pentagon doesn't want to take them back, and the CIA doesn't want to take them back because they want to maintain yeah, some leverage. Them. He wanted them out in 24 hours, 48 hours, yeah, and so then Mattis had to talk him uh, out of it. But uh, on the Russia-Iran, I mean, it's just, like I tell you, it's a deja vu. We've, we've written so many articles. Oh, Russia is maybe splitting with Iran and Syria. Oh, there is some cracks. Oh, they're not agreeing on this. Oh, maybe they will. Uh, they're not. They're, you know, they're fighting on the same team. They might have some, um, you know, minor tactical differences, but at the end of the day, uh, Russia needs Iran in Syria, uh, I think, more than uh, Iran needs Russia. Uh, the boots on the ground that are helping and fighting for Assad that are bleeding for Assad, whether it's a Lebanese militia or an Iraqi militia or Afghani militia or others, mercenaries coming from China, they're Iranian funded and they're Iranian armed. So while Russia is playing the public game brilliantly, they're emerging as a major international power broker in Syria. They've, um, they've actually have better relations with the Gulf states now, uh, yeah. including Qatar, including Saudi, including UAE, and Trump pulling from the Iran deal. You know, guess who wins? Russia and China. So uh, in that sense, and, and they have good relations with Turkey as well. In that sense, diplomatically, they are emerging as a power broker in Syria. Uh, but when it, come, when it comes to ground fighting and securing Assad, who is fairly secure now, making sure he wins down the road, maybe in the next six months, he secures you know, maybe the south, uh, they're very much on the 
uh, same page. And it, I don't think Trump, uh, Putin is interested in deploying troops in Syria. So until that happens, he is uh, reliant on uh, paramilitary Iranian forces. I will. Use the mic. Use the mic. Oh, sorry. In the new uh, executive master's program here, and I'm actually a career K-12 educator, so apologies in advance if I'm totally ill-informed. <laughs> um, my question is, looking past Trump, uh, you know, what can we do to try and fix this relationship? And I'm particularly interested in what I think is the totally backwards paradigm uh, in our relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, other than the Iranian revolution and kind of the spiraling downward trend since then, it doesn't make any sense that we would be in bed with the Saudis and not the Iranians. Um, you know, they're certainly bad actors in the region, but it's hard to find an uglier export than Wahhabism, uh, you know, compared to what the Iranians do. There's a cultural history uh, that the United States and Iran have in common that we don't with Saudi Arabia. Um, so whether, it, you know, I know you can't just <clears throat> flip that paradigm, nor would you want to flip it, but A, how do we repair the relationship, and B, how do we try and find some balance between being friends with, I would argue, a worse actor and being enemies with a still kind of bad actor, but for no apparent reason. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things, uh, I think you raised some great questions. Uh, one of the questions I would put at the outset is, does Iran want uh, a better relationship with the United States? And I think uh, the nuclear deal was kind of the trial balloon for whether that was possible. And uh, Trump just uh, delivered the negative verdict on that. So I think there's a lot of distrust right now. Uh, the nuclear deal did kind of open up this window to test whether it was possible to have a a more balanced uh, relationship with Iran. Um, and if you go back to, uh, you know, Obama's summit with the GCC countries where he essentially told them you need to learn how to share the region with Iran, uh, that, that position has been completely reversed under Trump, who's, uh, you know, hugged the uh, Saudis and uh, the UAE and Israelis very tight and then uh, punished Iran, uh, you know, across the board, including with the, the ban uh, that's affected Iranians. So, um, you know, I, you know, the, the, the Saudis are certainly, uh, you know, a, a major contributor to uh, the regional instability. And I think uh, you, when you look at the, the bombing of Yemen and the U.S. support for that, that's something that should definitely, uh, you know, get a lot more attention than it is getting. Uh, it is uh, increasing instability. Uh, I think if you look at uh, kind of the orientation of a lot of the um, – you know, terrorist groups in the region as well, they are, you know, uh, of the Wahhabi slant, uh, at least those that are oriented, uh, you know, against the United States and so forth. So there are kind of these long-standing questions, but, you know, kind of the history of U.S.-Iran relationship uh, keeps kind of getting in the way uh, whenever there seems like there's an opening, uh, you know, one side or another isn't ready to take the next step. And I think that's what we've seen with, a, you know, a giant leap back here under Trump. Yeah, we seem to be snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. I mean, just when you're on the edge of something that could consolidate and open up the relationship, something happens. Um, what about the internal dynamics in Iran over next steps? Is there any, uh, given the, the, um, the impact that the president's decision had on the public in Iran, is there still any jockeying among the clerics? with the younger urban-oriented people, the, uh, the rural or small towners in terms of, of um, taking a second look? Or is it for the time being a nation unified, nothing's going to change, they're going to wait to see what happens by the end of the year? Well, I think kind of the political elite is going to kind of close ranks. Uh, it's very interesting you when you look back at the 2017 uh, election uh, in Iran. Uh, Rouhani was very critical of the IRGC, its launching of, uh, IRGC, of missiles. IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard. Right. Uh, its launching of missiles with, uh, you know, threats against Israel, uh, you know, which he said was undermining uh, Iran's economic relief under the deal. Uh, was very critical uh, of the guards. And, uh, you know, he actually floated 
uh, this idea of uh, you know lifting, getting all of the sanctions lifted. I think you know since uh, Trump has been more aggressive uh, against the nuclear deal after that, a lot of that opportunity and those divides have been uh, you know that window has closed. Uh, but one of the big things out there that was supposed to happen, you know, mo most likely was going to happen under the 15 years of the JCPOA, had it been implemented in full, is uh, you know there was going to be uh, a passing of Ali Khamenei, most likely during that time. Time, and then a, a transition for only, uh, what, the second time in the history of the Islamic Republic. And this is an area where, you know, if uh, the, the moderates are, are consolidated and pushing and looking for change, it opens up a, a tremendous amount of opportunity where you have a, a country where the population is relatively moderate, uh, re relatively secular, wants uh, a, a, a greater say in their policy, wants more moderate policies at home uh, to push the country in, uh, in a different direction. I think if the elites are consolidating around the hard line, then it becomes much more cautious and so forth. Uh, but this is, you know, something that is either uh, that's still on the radar in the you know medium term. I would say. The next elections in Iran are 2020 for parliament and 2021 for president. For president, mm -hmm. um, right. and Khamenei's staying power. He's what 78 going on. 79. Yeah. 79. Yeah. 79. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah. that's. This is going to unify them in, the, in a way we would not find in, our, in, our inter, in the interests of some kind of, of forward progress. Question. Yeah. Um, my question is about uh, China and the extent to which you think um, the U.S.'s extraterritorial, you know, the extra, extraterritorial nature of the sanctions might be effective. Obviously, a lot of European companies have a lot of exposure to the U.S. market, <coughs> so it's not as possible. I know, like the we saw uh, China uh, launching the, that rail, uh, the other rail connection with Tehran, um, just a couple of days after the U.S. announcement. Um, do you think that uh, the U.S. would be effective in like this diplomatic rope show to try to convince you know China and uh, Japan and South Korea to reduce their oil exports to Iran? Um, do you think that Chinese companies, especially like medium-sized companies, will choose to stay in the market? Mm -hmm. Um, I think Japan and South Korea will will fall into line because they they're more concerned about the North Korea situation, uh, and they have other trade disputes with the United States as well that they're worried about. Uh, China is an interesting question. Um, you know, China already has a bank called Kunlun Bank, which uh, which deals with Iran, has no exposure to the dollar, no exposure to American banks. Um, they can create other financial. Uh, bodies that, that are similarly protected from sanctions. They're also launching their own oil futures market, right. uh, demarcated in UN right. uh, in Shanghai. And I would imagine that Iran will avail itself of that to, to sell some of its oil and get away from concerns, again, about dollars, euros, uh, you know, problems with, with selling to, to, uh, to Europe uh, in particular. Um, China will have a lot of leverage over Iran. And um, yeah, they're already involved with various railroad pro uh, projects, other infrastructure projects. They're going to take over a, a gas field project that Total looks like it will yes. withdraw from. Uh, so I mean, I've been writing all along. I wrote for months before Trump did this. This is going to make China stronger. You're making China great again. That's what you're doing. And um, you know, he doesn't care. I mean, he has other. He, we're now in a separate trade war with China, but, but um, in 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 this instance, he is very much increasing Iran's reliance uh, on uh, on China. Please. Just continuing on that, what do you think the impact of greater in, of increased Chinese influence are, uh, will have on Iranian politics in the mm -hmm. Um I mean, in Iran, there are various camps, you know, that identify more with the West, more with Russia, more with China. Again, it strengthens the hardliners who say you can have the benefits of a market economy and, and a completely authoritarian political system. Um, so it undercuts, again, the people that we would normally support, those who would like to see a more democratic uh, system of government in Iran. Uh, and if I can add, you're also seeing China more involved in, uh, for example, reconstruction in Syria. Uh, Chinese delegation visited 
Lebanon to try to, uh, you know, start talking about reconstruction contracts and projects in Syria. So when it comes to, to China, there are no, uh, you know, set of values, whether, you know, democratic, or, or, or nuclear or else uh, that uh, control its, uh, its behavior, whether in Africa or in the Middle East. Uh, they're also talking, again, about the Silk Road. The Belt, uh, yeah, the belt, the belt and Road. Yeah, with, with the, to the GCC. So, so you see uh, that element of more uh, present uh, Chinese uh, influence without being, uh, it's almost the anti-Trump. You don't feel it. You don't. You don't see uh, she going out and say, "I'm moving my embassy to, I don't know, to Senegal or something." You know, it's it's not. It's it's very subtle, or it's not subtle. I guess it's. Uh, I mean, it, it's business oriented. It's not based on human rights. It's not just transactional, and that works uh, in the region. I just want to go to your question quickly on on Saudi. Uh, I think. You know, also growing up uh, near Tripoli, Lebanon, where there was a lot of Wahhabi Salafi influence, and you see it over the years, but I think it's important to recognize now that there is change, and it's not easy change happening in Saudi Arabia. And that presents, I think, an opportunity if the foreign policy is complemented with that. We're not seeing that yet. But if, if, you know, rivalry becomes about soccer stadiums or women driving or jazz concerts, that'll be, that'll be great. Uh, we're not there yet, but I think, you know, there is, there is change happening in the kingdom. Uh, there is, uh, we don't agree with the tactics, I guess, here in, you know, in the United States that, for example, he imprisoned a lot of the radical uh, clergies. One of them was just spewing anti-Semitism on Twitter, uh, you know, routinely. So, so it's. Uh, I think Saudi Arabia is changing, and that's that could be uh, to the benefit uh, of the region. You want to see how you can capitalize on it in in foreign policy, and that hasn't uh, that hasn't happened. Please. Hi, I'm Sailor Perkins. I'm from the Bush School. I'm a Robertson Fellow. Uh, so Secretary Pompeo recently announced five goals for Syria, one of them clearly being keeping Iran Iranian influence out of Syria for the long term. However, arguably, there's been little done about that. We still only have 2,000 troops in Syria, and we are very, very reluctant to come head-to-head -head with Iran or anyone else in Syria. And as we mentioned before, the issue of proxies has seemingly had very little influence on the JCPOA decision, if at all. Um, despite that being a major concern for the region and for the U.S. according to the Syria policy. So I was wondering, how do you see Iranian in-game in Syria playing out, their interests, number one? And two, how does the relationship or lack thereof between Iran and the U.S. in Syria relate to this greater conversation about the JCPOA and possible transitions in power under the Trump administration and in Iran? You have to parse that one. Yeah. Because it's Iran and Syria, but it's also Iran, U.S. and Syria, and then some other relations that U.S. has with Iran that go beyond it. Do you want to start? Yeah, I can. I can. Start I guess take uh, as you sure. see it. the Syria. I think this is the end game. This is yeah. the beautiful end game for Iran and Syria. You know, exporting militias, having more non-state actors, uh, building the bridge. It's it's there. It's. Uh, like, yeah, Pompeo's speech was, uh, you know, it, it had interesting phrases, but I don't know how the U.S. wants to push Iran out of Syria when the 2,000 troops it has, and, uh, I mean, Trump keeps saying he wants to get them out. So unless you want to embark on a, you know, big military uh, adventure, in Syria, I don't think Iran it will go anywhere, whether in Syria or, or, or in Iraq. Uh, I just, you know, I keep going back to, to Lebanon, but seeing where, how far Hezbollah has gone from 1982 uh, till today, that just doesn't bode well for uh, 
uh, for any U.S. or other uh, push uh, against Iran uh, in the region. Uh, I mean, where you could see maybe changes if, if, if let's say, Assad wins, maybe in five, six years, you try to work with the Assad regime against uh, Iran, but that hasn't been successful in the last uh, four decades. So yeah, I, I really, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree with that. Your, your second question I'm a little confused about. That was the relationship between the JCPOA and? Generally, how the issue of Iran in Syria fits mm -hmm. into this greater conversation of Iranian-American relations, mm -hmm. since there's the whole conversation of proxies or lack of conversation yeah. about proxies, yeah. I mean, and then taking out of the JCPOA. Yeah. Uh, you know, look, the Obama administration decided that the nuclear issue was the issue that they could likely reach, not just an agreement with Iran about, but a sort of international consensus about. Um, and there is no international consensus about uh, what the Middle East should look like. Um, you know, Russia certainly supports Iran and Syria, for example. So I think that's, that was one of the reasons. Also, the nuclear issue was seen. I mean, the Israelis were the ones who were beating the war drums and, you know, constantly saying the sky is falling and Iran will have the bomb next week. Uh, so it was seen as a way to sort of uh, calm the, the Israelis down and prevent the outbreak of a war that Israel might start and drag the United States into. That was a very important part of the Obama yeah. thinking. Back in 2012 and, yeah. and, and 2013. Um, so the, the issue of, of the regional, as I, as I mentioned, the JCPOA was supposed to be, you know, as, as, as uh, Foreign Minister Zarif says, it was supposed to be the, the, the foundation, not the ceiling, that if, if, if this would work and we could and this could be implemented, then could talk about, about other, uh, other issues. And that now has been thrown away by the Trump administration. Maybe it was not a conversation that would have been very productive. We, we really won't know. Uh, the Europeans are talking to the Iranians about Yemen. Uh, they've continued uh, to try to build on the JCPOA. And I, you know, Yemen, I think, is one area where Iran's interests are rather limited, mostly uh, confined to just annoying the Saudis and bogging them down in, in this unwinnable conflict. So that might be one area. But there again, where is the American diplomacy? Where is the American leadership? I don't see it. Um, I, see, I see experienced American diplomats leaving the Foreign Service one after another. Uh, and. Uh, you know, just no U.S. real U.S. involvement uh, in trying to, to settle Yemen. Just a kind of blank check to the Saudis and the Emiratis and the Israelis to continue to, to intervene here and there against, uh, against Iran. Um, and, you know, a, a wish list from Pompeo and, you know, uh, of things that he would love the Iranians to do, but they're not going to do. But that's a continuity from Obama, no? I mean... I think, I think that the Obama administration was more active, particularly on Yemen. Yeah. They really were trying to get that uh, resolved. And I, I just don't, you know, maybe it's a lack of personnel in part from Trump. They just don't have the people. Um, but I don't, I don't see a diplomatic push, uh, uh, you know, on, on any of these Middle Eastern conflicts. Yeah, I mean, there, there is no... The thing is, again, you know, the problem was not the nuclear deal by itself. The problem was none of the other regional issues were, were, were addressed. Even, you know, get, get everyone to, he brought them to Camp David. We went, it was too late in the game. Mm -hmm. It was, you don't, you, you can't expect from a Saudi king to learn about your decision from watching uh, Al Arabiya channel when he decided to, uh, he's not gonna uh, bomb Assad. Call him up. I mean, where is U.S. diplomacy? God, we've been like, I, I don't know. It, it's been just missing. This is not, like, I came to this country. We, we you know, we studied Kissinger. We learned about Holbrook. Uh, but these giants in, in U.S. foreign policy, and you look around now, 
Wow, great. I'm going to report today on U.S. polling from the Human Rights Council. Wow, amazing. And then, you know, U.S. polling from uh, UNESCO. I'm going to report about Obama giving a speech from the Rose Garden. Lovely about just asking Congress to vote on punishing a dictator for using chemical weapons against, his, against children. This is unacceptable. I mean, you know, think about whatever you want about Saudi or others or this. This is just, there is no American leadership and there hasn't been for, for a really long time. I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe 2020, maybe 2024. I, I don't know. I've just, uh, we just going. take it uh, day you by know, day. We had something called the Iraq War. I think that made right. people a little nervous about, about you know, military solutions to things. So, um, and, yeah. and, and nobody also asked Obama to come out and call on Assad to step down. Mm. And if you, I think somebody, you could invite to, to speak to the students or uh, to you guys is, you know, uh, Fred Hoff, yeah. who wrote about this, who was in the room, and he said, Mr. President, we need a plan B if we're going to call on him to step down. Well, Ben Rhodes had a different vision yeah. for how the Middle East, how Syria may go down. He said, no, this is will, he will fall in a matter of weeks, like what happened in Tunisia, like what happened in Egypt. Now you know Rhodes can write a book and hmm. sell, you know, become a bestseller and get a contract with MSNBC and Syria is in shambles. So the, uh, uh, this is not, again, the, the American uh, leadership you guys or, or this country should aspire to. I'm going way beyond my journalistic objectivity <laughs> here, but it's, it's honestly frustrating. It's, it's our region. It's, it's, this is, now we live in this country and it's, it's extremely frustrating. So the, 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 your question, Seller, about JCPOA and its relationship to the regional conflict, and really, that, I think basically, apart from the fact that President Trump opposed anything Obama did, inherently, the JCPOA was faulty, as the quote is, it's the worst deal ever. ever yeah. um, but the animus, the extra emphasis came from his interests in our relations with Israel. And that's a, that's a profoundly domestic, not international necessarily, not certainly, quote unquote, objectively arrived at by Kissingerian geopolitical strategic interests. He sees Israel as the linchpin to his one, a big portion of his constituency. That's true too. Israel has a, a compelling arguments to be made with that, that portion of our public and uh, Israel sees Iran, it's ironic because 50 years ago they were best friends, you know, the Israeli military, the Iranian military, but, but from the revolution on, they became best enemies. And Israel sees this situation in a very much more extreme way, and they're using it for great advantage with this administration. So question, um, is there any way of, I mean, it, or do you think that there's a possibility of a looming conflict that Israel and Iran would engage in in Syria, or Israel actually taking a step ahead of Hezbollah in some kind of outbreak and conflict across the border that would drag us into it even further? What do you think? Yes, sure. I mean, uh, I mean, Israel has made a hobby of you know bombing Lebanon every five six years, and. Hello. Hi. How are you? Uh, and you know everybody in Lebanon is waiting for the next war. It's that's how people operate. In Syria, they're already. Um, it's in the last I think three months we've reported there has been at least at least since a between April and now at least six. Uh, Israeli uh, airstrikes on Iranian uh, targets in, in Syria. Now, Iran is not responding, uh, is not retaliating. They promise to re retaliate, but they, they also want to, um, you know, they want to just secure their wins in the country. And it's not in their interest to, to enter in an open confrontation uh, uh, with, with, uh, with Israel. Uh, my bigger concern is would 
Israel attack uh, Tehran is would they go for yeah. you know the the nuclear sites or or something else? Really, um, even with the refueling issue. Well, I mean, they have a lot of corridors now to go through. So, <coughs> so that's my. But I think Barbara could address this better. Uh, but yeah. for now, I think the Iranian-Israeli confrontation is more likely to be uh, confined in, in Syria. Uh, but if it really gets bigger in Syria, yeah, you bet, it's going to drag uh, to Lebanon, because that's where, uh, I mean, that's where the Hezbollah uh, headquarters are, and that's where the, the heavy weaponry uh, is located. So, yeah. I think the Israelis are very happy with the situation now because they can attack targets in Syria with impunity. Uh, the Russians, they've reached some sort of understanding with the Russians about this. Um, and, um, you know, let's remember the Israelis have maybe 200 nuclear weapons. Uh, they're the big kahuna. They, they're the existential threat to Iran, not the other way around. Um, the way they see it now, Iran is, is going to be isolated again, sanctioned again, uh, fearful of reinvigorating its nuclear program. Uh, they feel they have complete support from the Trump administration. They've just seen the U.S. Embassy be moved. I mean, they're, they're sitting pretty. So I, I, I'm less worried about a big uh, confrontation there. I'm more worried about Iran simply being forced to look toward China and Russia for its uh, economic and security relationships and, and, and away from, from Europe. Um, uh, I think that's, that's, that's more likely. So to introduce Nick Schifrin, thank you very much. Sorry about the traffic, which is incredible. Even coming into the district, it's amazing. It, it's my apologies. It's my apologies. I, I wish I had a better excuse, but I was just sitting in traffic, so not very interesting. The, uh, tell us a bit about the Korea, uh, the, the Kim Trump, uh, <laughs> what would you call it, a meeting, I guess, is the most anodyne word for it. And, and what, if any, implication does it have for the Middle East? Yeah. There's, there's a New Yorker cartoon I'm reminded of uh, in which the TV correspondent uh, is on the left side of the cartoon and he's covering his eyes and he's got a dart pointed at a dartboard and the dartboard says what I'm going to cover today. So that I'm, I'm throwing a dart at a dartboard here. So we're going to talk about North Korea for a second. Um, the, the summit was a lot of style, which is the substance of the president. So what I mean by that is that there was a propaganda film essentially made by the White House that was delivered to Chairman Kim, uh, and, and the President was quite proud of that. Uh, what became essentially a, a photo op that started a process, of course, for the last four months was, you know, we're going to do everything at once, uh, became, well, you know, he pissed me off and we're going to cancel it, no, it's back on. So the the actual act of this going back and forth, the actual act of just having this unprecedented meeting um, is, is part of the substance of what the president's trying to do and, and part of the substance of his diplomacy. Uh, and so as, as you've all seen, there was very little substance actually in the statement. Uh, but it goes along with what the U.S. has done now uh, at least two or three or four times, depending on how you count it, which is a joint statement uh, that is the beginning of the first time was a four-year process, the second time was a five or six-year process that ends generally with the North Koreans cheating and the U.S. pulling out of deal or, or vice versa. Uh, and so what the U.S. says is that this is different because the president is involved and Kim himself, whichever Kim we're talking about, whether this Kim or his father or his grandfather are involved directly. And so that leads to what is um, the president's argument, the administration's argument, is about Iran as well. Uh, there were a lot of us who, who asked Secretary Pompeo and others, well, why would North Korea enter an agreement when you've just pulled out of one? Why would they trust you to negotiate in good faith and negotiate an agreement that will outlast the whims of the president or the administration or frankly the term of the administration and they say because we're different 
we are this administration and, and the people before us uh, didn't know what they were doing or simply didn't do it correctly. And so the substantive version of that is we're going to do, we, the administration, we're going to do a peace treaty this time. So that is what they are saying about what they want with North Korea. So a treaty, as, as you guys know, two-thirds of the Senate has to approve that, right? The uh, JCPOA um, is obviously not only not, I mean, it's, it's not a treaty, you know, period. Uh, and so obviously the president was able to pull out of it uh, relatively easily. And so the administration says, this is different because we're going to try a treaty. And this is different, frankly, because we're better than the guys who came before us. Uh, and so what the administration argues is that uh, Kim and the entire North Korean structure does not care about the Iran deal. Uh, does not even care, frankly, about the previous versions of these negotiations agreed framework, which ended in North Korean cheating. North Korea says the U.S. didn't deliver. Six-party talks, which ended in a different form of cheating. Again, the U.S. not delivering in a different way. Uh, the U.S., the administration says this is different because we are different. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so, so that goes back to the notion of uh, you know, the, the, what the Obama administration ended up with, which is we intervene, we screw up. It, it, it ends badly, right? We don't intervene, it ends badly, so we throw up our hands, right? So the Trump administration says that Iran and North Korea are different, that, that the standards set by the JCPOA are irrelevant to the standards that they are pursuing in North Korea. North Korea doesn't care about what the details of the JCPOA are, and that the administration is okay starting a process that they hope ends in denuclearization in two years, but realistically will end, you know, be a, a, a decade-long process. So that is the argument that they make. Do we know whether Kim Jong-un read the JCPOA and thought, hmm, this is good, this is bad? Maybe they'll ask for more, maybe they don't care, maybe they'll ask for us. Uh, we have no idea. We would be guessing if, if we assume that. But the administration's argument certainly is that Kim Jong-un does not care that the U.S. pulled out of JCPOA. That's the administration's perspective. Nothing to contradict it yet, anyway. Not yet. And, and look, you know, I think that even the president's critics uh, say we want him to succeed. You know, I think there's a lot of people in the Obama administration certainly in the Bush administration were part of the six-party talks and the Clinton administration were part of the agreed framework talks uh, who say we admit that you know what we tried didn't work and, and we went back into the historical piece before Singapore and every time the, the you know every time the chief US negotiator comes out and says this is gonna work and we've got the beginning of denuclearization and this time we had the president say you know that there is no nuclear threat from North Korea um, that is not true. There is obviously still a nuclear threat from North Korea. There is still obviously a missile threat from North Korea. Uh, and so again, j just to bring it back to, to Iran, um, the administration has, has you know, different standards, right? That, that they are pursuing a path of what they claim the CVID, complete verifiable, um, uh, why am I forgetting the I? Irreversible, right. Complete verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. But, but, you know, uh, on background or off the record, even people admit that, well, well, we'll figure out what that looks like. Whereas Iran, you can, you know, go through the JCPOA and talk about all the things that it accomplished, uh, and, and the administration does not use that as a benchmark simply because they didn't want anything to do with that, uh, whereas they want a new deal with North Korea. Have you seen, uh, caught any... Uh uh, comments from people in the administration you've dealt with of, of differing over um, regime change or mm -hmm. just behavior change vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Nick? Yeah, certainly. So, so the obvious person to bring up here is John Bolton. Uh, so John Bolton's national security advisor uh, has been on the hawkish wing of the hawkish wing for a long time and has believed in regime change, has written, uh, not as national security advisor, of course, but has written in his time between uh, the time he was at the State Department and ambassador to the UN until he's, he's joined this administration, about the necessity for regime change in, in Iran and uh, essentially the necessity for regime change in North Korea. And so what the argument goes, and, and this is really the difference between the two, the argument goes that the Iranian 
regime is based on antipathy to the United States, i.e., it cannot exist if it drops its antipathy to the U.S. Uh, Bolton and, and a few others, Elliot Cohen at size, Ray Takia, you know, reject the notion that there will be uh, either, either kind of rational decisions by the supreme leader uh, or, frankly, willingness to negotiate that much. And a lot of other people say, well, wait a minute. They, they agreed to the JCPOA. They agreed to, f to, to these restrictions and these freezes. And historically, Iran has had uh, a long history of very rational foreign policy decision making. Uh, and, and yes, there are, of course, hardliners and more moderates. But actually, um, there's a lot of consensus in foreign policy decision making. Bolton rejects that. Uh, and so the rejection is that we need to replace the Iranian regime. He has also said the same about North Korea. That is not the pursuit, right now at least, of this administration. They believe that the North Koreans can be convinced to change. Please. But he also, I mean, yeah, I don't think regime change is at all in the courts for North Korea. In fact, the <laughs> Singapore <laughs> summit, I mean, he legitimized. Right. Yeah, the guy. Exactly. That's the point. There, there's yeah. a difference. And, and in a sense, so you look at Iran, it was about the nuclear program. It was about lowering enrichment. It was about centrifuges, all this nerdy data uh, we were you know, reporting on. North Korea is almost the complete opposite. I mean, they've given nothing. I mean, they've really, uh, like they blew up the nuclear site, but we don't even know if it's a... It, was, uh, it had all suffered some grave damage to the last nuclear test. So there's some consideration that it wouldn't have been any use to them anyway. Yeah, and, and then, okay, the hostages, but uh, two of them were taken uh, under, uh, under Trump. And it's, uh, there's this great expert at Brookings, Jung Park. Uh, she worked in the CIA, and she would make the argument that it's very costly for North Korea to, to keep uh, hostages. Uh, the, it's almost a very, it's the opposite picture from what we've seen with Iran in a sense too that he's going to his neighbors and saying, okay, I'm going to eat noodles or whatever in, 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 in yeah. South Korea. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you have that different dimension yeah, going I, on. Yeah, I, I wrote about this at the time. One of the many reasons we wouldn't see a Singapore, Singapore summit with Iran uh, was because of the regional posture. In, in Northeast Asia, you have uh, China, South Korea, and Japan certainly favoring the summit, if not the flimsy statement that came out of it, whereas you have the reverse. In the Middle East, you've got Israel, Saudi Arabia, and UAE egging oh, okay. the United States on to maintain a hostile relationship uh, with Iran. So it's just simply not, not, not conducive, whatever the Iranian government may feel or not feel about perpetual enmity with the United States. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a light year difference. I mean, the question of stability in Northeast Asia, that's been a matter of public discourse and interaction among the states there for 50 years. And um, China is a dominant force in that region. They, above all else, they don't want instability from inside North Korea or between North and South, or or with Japan and Korea, the triangle. Um, you don't have that. It's, it's almost the opposite. No. The stakeholders in the region, in the Middle East, are really using this this debacle and this conflict to stake out a position, to take position. And that's the danger of any of these regional conflicts exploding. When the stakeholders bring in the other powers, the great powers, that's, that's the thing to be really worried about. But there's also a long history of Washington seeing East Asia in a very different light than it Absolutely. sees the Middle East. And you can yeah. go back to General MacArthur yeah. and some of the language <coughs> he used against Koreans yeah. or about the Chinese uh, to, see, uh, to see the origins of that. Yeah. But could it have been, my question to Barbara, could it have been different under Obama if he had, if he had started, let's say, with a... Saudi, put them all in, like, mm -hmm. not, not in this room, but you know, bring them all and start with a regional conference, or was it just not? Uh, well, I don't know if the Saudis would have agreed to attend. I mean, the, the you know, the, the enmity between, which you pointed out, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, is particularly with this King Salman and this Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia have, have cooperated in the past. They've had 
uh, security agreements in the past as well as clashes in the past. This is unprecedented, this level of hostility. You have another element. I mean, beyond MBS trying to prove himself, you've got Mohammed bin Zayed in UAE, uh, who, you know, they see themselves as little Sparta. Uh, they're expanding, they're taking over ports, uh, you know, in Somalia and, uh, and other places. They have a very uh, inflated view of their role in the region uh, with U.S. backing and, and Saudi backing. Um, and, and, you know, that's something new that we have certainly have not seen from the UAE before. It used to be that they were very much focused on, on commerce and Dubai was the more important emirate. Now it's Abu Dhabi. Um, you know, so uh, it, it's just, it's, it's very hard to, I think, to compare uh, the two situations. Also, Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons, never had nuclear weapons. So, um, you know, whereas North Korea really was beca becoming I, a big threat. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do struggle with this question because it, it was King Abdullah, you know, when, when, when everything started. So was there a missed opportunity to start regionally or did the Arab Spring just take everyone uh, by surprise? Uh, I don't know, I feel I have to, on the UAE, to weigh in because, you know, my paper is is based in, in Abu Dhabi. When you travel there, you get a sense of confidence, a sense of... Uh, They're it, feeling their oats, yeah. Uh, internally and uh, maybe externally, but I don't, I don't feel uh, the... My experience that it's the priority is an anti-Iran. It's more... Uh, about a certain view of the region mm. as an anti, uh, uh, is like Islamist extremist narrative mm. in the region that that drives uh, the and UAE. power projection. I mean, we are seeing real power projection from the yeah. UAE. We've never seen that before. Uh, you know, so they really feel they've got the U.S. behind them, the Saudis behind them, and that they can they can be a real power to be reckoned with there, uh, which is kind of a joke because it's a it's a tiny little nothing, and here's Iran with over 80 million people that's been there for 5,000 years in the UAE, which didn't even exist until 1970, whatever, right? Right, but but again, to their to their, and I don't want to get now into the what Iran did, what you know, Saudi, UAE, Lebanon, Kuwait, whatever. <laughs> It's, uh, you, you know, you, if you visit Abu Dhabi, if you go to the Louvre, if you go to, to other place, places, we thought Beirut will be the model in, in one, in, in, you know, in the yeah. banking industry and everything. And look at us. We ended up, you know, engaging in a 15-year civil war, and here we are uh, today, and we could go to war again if you, if not you, but if others sent. Mm -hmm. uh, arms, I guess. So credit to, uh, I think, to the UAE, to where they are uh, today internally, uh, is, is they're at a very uh, high economic and uh, I think even socially, culturally open uh, model in, mm -hmm. in the region. Uh, there is definitely a more aggressive push, uh, yeah. but that started even under Obama. I mean, you know, they, they were very much against the rise of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Mm -hmm. We see the, the Sisi come in. Oh, now they're active in Libya and other places. So yeah, Libya, I left out Libya. <laughs> yeah, so many different dimensions there. I think that, that gives them the, the confidence they're, uh, they're at today. Please. I'm Mackenzie. I'm a MAIR student um, at the Maxwell School. Um, my question is kind of, you've said that it never, was never about the nuclear stuff, but what do you see the future looking like for a non-proliferation regime? S so, I mean, is it going to be kind of status quo even with this North Korea stuff and with the pulling out of JCPOA, or does the general non-proliferation regime, is there a change or a movement coming positive, negative, or...? I think there's going to be a real crisis coming up here at the next uh, non-proliferation treaty review where you have, uh, you know, the JCPOA, which was supposed to be, you know, essentially the premise, if Iran abides by this, it gets a clean bill of health from the IAEA, then the nuclear issue is resolved. And all of a sudden, Iran is back in the penalty box, even though it abided by the agreement. And I think, you know, combined with the Singapore summit, the message uh, to the Iranians is get nuclear weapons. 
and then you'll be treated seriously. This is exactly what Tom Cotton was saying uh, you know, just the other week, is we won't deal with a two-bit regime that doesn't even have nuclear weapons. Uh, once a regime does have nuclear weapons, then we've got to sit down and negotiate with them. It's almost verbatim what he said, which is, you know, get nuclear weapons, which is, you know, goes against, you know, decades of uh, U.S. foreign policy. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the way we are. Uh, that's the position we're in right now. When I think about, you know, what does the, the Trump decision on the nuclear deal mean for, for future uh, deals? Under the Trump administration, I think regimes will probably realize, well, okay, we strike a deal with Trump, then it's a deal with Trump, and nothing else really matters because that's all he cares about. But the Iranians in the future, this was a deal that was designed uh, to protect against Iranian cheating. It wasn't designed to protect against U.S. cheating, where you have some sort of, uh, you know, disillusion of the uh, U.S. sanctions regime. You know, the Iranians are going to drive a really hard bargain the next time that they're at the ne negotiating table to make sure that, uh, you know, if the U.S. pulls out of the deal, that they get uh, something in return. And I think that's the kind of long-term thing that, uh, you know, we're digging ourselves a big hole in. What are they like? Likely to ask for in return. <laughs> Money, economic openness. Yeah, guarantees. I mean, it's what uh, they're uh, asking of the Europeans right now, and I think we're seeing shifts toward, uh, you know, countries testing whether they're able to create financial structures that don't uh, involve the U.S. in order to get around uh, U.S. sanctions. Uh, you know, some of these. Uh, currency exchange uh, programs, independent banks, uh, and so forth. Uh, I don't think the Europeans have had the time, really, to uh, prepare that economic infrastructure in order to necessarily uh, put themselves on a good foot to save the JCPOA. But I, I'm sure there are going to be increasing conversations uh, about the vulnerability to US sanctions and, and how to craft an independent foreign policy. Well, Please, no. Just two quick points. One, um, <clears throat> to bring up John Bolton again, the National Security Advisor has, it has generally disparaged arms agreements in general, and so we'll see his influence, whether that increases or not. Uh, and the second is, back to CVID, you know, if the U.S. does not keep insisting on complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization, if they accept, right, a North Korea nuclear presence, which is possible, uh, then you're really in a serious crisis because yeah. then you have the first example of the United States allowing, you know, someone breaking the no nuclear nonproliferation treaty and and becoming an official nuclear power. So, so far, there's no evidence of that. They they say that you know they need to get rid of everything, but we'll see what happens. Can I, uh, just one quick thing, and uh, you know, for the Middle East, what it means is I mean. The Middle East is not, um, you know, it's not the Scandinavian uh, countries. It's, it's Iran is not Norway, Saudi is not uh, Iceland or Denmark. So if you see Iran increasing enrichment, getting a nuclear uh, weapon, yeah, you bet it's gonna Saudi will be next. Uh, they've said it publicly, I think. So uh, you know, welcome to the nuclear arms race uh, of the the amazing race uh, of the of the Middle East so that in a in a nutshell over here and then there and then over there Ben Linden State Department building on that point about Saudi Arabia there's been discussion of potentially entering into a one two three agreement with Saudi Arabia between the US for supposedly peaceful uh, uses of nuclear technology in Saudi Arabia uh, and at, at the same time, we have this discussion openly in some cases about potentially developing a nuclear program as a deterrent there. How serious is, do you take the possibility that the U.S. will engage uh, in such a deal? And what kind of challenges did that uh, also present to the nonproliferation regime? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's serious. You've had... Um Meetings. Uh, I mean, they've they've meeting not just with the U.S. I think they're meeting the French, they're meeting the Chinese. I believe uh, over the same issue. Uh, and the U.S. says, you know, if we don't uh, if we don't get this uh, the, the contract with Saudis, other uh, will. But it's a very uh, from from what's been reported, from what we've uh, got from Saudi officials, it's a very peaceful uh, nuclear program. Uh, same with the UAE, they have a peaceful nuclear program. Pompeo actually uh, quoted both in, in addressing uh, Iran that that would be the benchmark 
to to achieve that's accepted by the U.S. is if their program would be similar to uh, UAE or the one that uh, Saudi will uh, develop. Given where how they have very good relations with Trump, I would. I mean, just speculating, but it's it's very likely that the U.S. would be the one helping uh, in this program. My goodness. Um, even, even as close as the Israelis and the Saudis are privately, I can't imagine that the Israelis would be happy about that. I mean, I'm not a nuclear expert, so I wouldn't... <laughs> you Brian, would, you're, you you're, would, you're uh, the guy. You know, I, I think if there is an agreement with the United States, it would have to go through Congress first. Right. And then, therefore, if it's not the gold standard, no enrichment, no reprocessing, it's, uh, you know, very much likely to mm -hmm. run aground. Um, I think the Obama administration position was, uh, you know, you either do the gold standard or you go on your own. I think the Saudis have likely, uh, you know, tried to see if that has shifted. And I think there are certain uh, officials within the administration that, uh, yeah, would, would water down that standard. But, uh, you know, I, I think Congress would be the, uh, uh, the uh, goalie in this situation. But don't forget Pakistan. So, you know, the, the, the Pakistanis owe the Saudis a lot of money, and the Saudis have said, we may come calling one day. Uh, and so that's, that's been the, the Saudi threat, of course, to go to Pakistan for, for nuclear help. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think it's a big threat moving forward, depending on what Iran does. Pakistan had a long time benefited from their relations with North Korea mm -hmm. and Iran and a little bit of Russia, especially after the, the decline, the end of the Soviet Union, those Russian scientists, many of whom we were able to subsidize to prevent them from going wildcat, some of them did. So you have this circulation of technology and ideas. And no, the rest I mean, and Khamenei is the only actually Middle East leader who uh, went to North Korea. So hmm. that's really, I don't know, I find that interesting. Now Bashar Assad wants to go. Uh, hmm. Yeah, maybe you invite, we all go. That's <laughs> <laughs> with Bolton, hmm. your friend, yeah. Hi, my name is Kelsey Ritchie, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, my question is dealing with the growing relationship between Iran and Turkey, um, and kind of the way that the United States should be viewing that. Specifically, we've seen a lot of forces kind of come into conflict in Manbij, and we're seeing the Kurds become an issue um, with Turkey refusing to allow them into peace negotiations. We're now seeing Iran promising Turkey that they will help them fight the PKK. Um, where, where do U.S. interests both align um, in Syria, and where are we really starting to see a split between U.S. and our NATO ally, Turkey? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, how much time we have? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's also been an interesting week. Barbara, if you want to please go first. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, look. Um, Iran and Turkey have very important economic relations, which they have managed to maintain even during previous sanctions period. You may remember uh, the Turkish government trying to resolve the nuclear uh, issue when Ahmadinejad was still uh, the president of Iran. They had a Tehran declaration with Brazil that uh, Obama, in the end, did not did not uh, support. Um, it's, it's complicated. I mean, Turkey certainly doesn't like the Assad regime, but it's been very clear that their priority now is the Kurdish issue and making sure that, uh, that their Kurdish adversaries don't get a really uh, significant autonomous foothold in, Tur in, uh, in Syria. And the Iranians agree with them on that, because the Iranians have a Kurdish population that they uh, repress with great regularity. And... Um, so I think they've, they've reached some, some deals on that. Um, and of course the Russians are brokering, you know, the, the poor Kurds in Syria now have had to fall back on the Russians again because the United States is once again double-crossing them now that they helped us get rid of Daesh in, in, uh, in Syria. Now the U.S. has made a deal with the Turks. <laughs> um, poor Kurds, they never get a break. Uh, yeah. Um, but I would expect uh, the Iran-Turkey relationship to remain very strong. I was in a meeting uh, not long ago with some uh, Turkish members of parliament who said that they would find a way to get around the sanctions if the U.S. reimposed them uh, and to continue to buy Iranian uh, natural gas. I'm sure, uh, you know, I uh, Iranians can go to Turkey without visas, so they get a lot of, a lot of tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been a lot of money laundering through Turkey in the past, and I'm sure there will be uh, in, in the future. 
Yeah, but with the U.S., I mean, it's, I think it's in a, on a collision course in, in Syria. Just this week, you've seen um, uh, Congress, the Senate, actually approve um, the block on uh, F-35 sales to Turkey, uh, 85 to 10. That's a very high mark. Uh, at the same time, you've seen the U.S. military just try to calm things down because they need Turkey in, in northern uh, Syria. So you saw the Membej uh, agreement and the announcement of uh, joint uh, patrolling uh, mission between the U.S. and Turkey in Membej. Now, that's the very early stages in the agreement. Uh, speaking to Aaron Stein, Atlantic Council, and his point of view is this is the easy part to be uh, implemented. Uh, the Turkey wants the YPG uh, to leave uh, Membej, you know, to, to form a new uh, provincial uh, council. I don't know if that, that will happen. Uh, you're seeing also Turkey, I mean, they hold the U.S. pastor uh, from North Carolina, mm -hmm. Branson. So, it's, I don't know, I mean, it's the, the, the trend inside Turkey is a little uh, worrisome. I think they're number two now or one. Did they uh, surpass China in jailing journalists? Yeah, they're number one in the world for jailing journalists. So uh, this is, I remember, I mean, you know, we're, we, we all we would all remember when Turkey was, you know, cited as a model for maybe democracy in, in, in the Middle East, well, that's, I don't think, distant memory. that's, yeah, very distant memory. So in that sense, uh, if they buy the S-400 defense system <laughs> from Russia, that will be very alarming uh, for NATO. Uh, in Syria, I think they need Iran. They need Russia more than the other way around. Uh, in, a way, in, in a way that to, to help them against the Stay Kurds right. yeah. and, and uh, mediate. For the first time, the UN envoy is inviting Turkey, Russia, uh, and Iran to a Geneva summit about Syria. The U.S. won't be there. Uh, so the changing dynamic that I think puts it at a more of a collision course with, with Washington. Question, I think, on this, please. I'll stand, I don't think it makes much of a difference. <laughs> uh, Ricardo Sanchez, Rosenthal Fellow. Uh, my question is, the Trump administration prefers to make negotiations on a bilateral versus a multilateral uh, level. How would a bilateral negotiation, a non-proliferation treaty, let's say, would look, would look like? And how would that resonate with our Western allies? With Iran? Uh, with Iran, uh, well, Iran uh, uh, North Korea, any, any kind of bilateral, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> it's going to look like what we got rid of with the JCPOA. Yeah. No, actually. Please. Well, you know, I think uh, going back to this idea, like Iran has you know, declined the opportunity to meet with uh, the Trump administration right after Trump's UNGA speech. And that was before he backed out of the uh, nuclear deal. And then even going back uh, to the Obama administration, I think they declined uh, the opportunity to meet one-on-one uh, -on -one Rouhani and Obama. So there's a reticence on the Iranian side still, uh, you know, about 40 years into the Islamic Republic to sit down and engage uh, you know, with the United States. So, uh, and now that uh, Trump has withdrawn from the deal, I mean, there's got to be a lot of uh, goodwill gestures, I think, before we even get to the point where uh, we can talk about it, uh, you know, with the likelihood that it would be, you know, or the chance that it could be in, in six months to a year or something along that lines. So it's just not on the horizon right now at all. Yeah, I think that's, that's an understatement. I, I think there's zero interest in the administration in, in talking to Iran. I don't know if I'm sure you guys brought up Secretary Pompeo's speech earlier, but essentially it was a regime change speech. That's what most, most people believe it to be. Uh, and so there's no evidence at all that the administration has any interest in any kind of bilateral negotiations with Iran, certainly not uh, anything close to what they're doing in North Korea. So, so there, is, there is no interest in that, I think. So... Um, you know, so we'll see how North Korea 
negotiations go and, and who knows, you know, with, um, there might be a change in mind uh, in the future, but <clears throat> no indication that, that this administration wants anything to do with the negotiation with Iran. They just want uh, behavior change. Time for one more question. Can I just add one thing on oh, North please. Korea? On North Korea, I mean, the administration thinks it's getting a bilateral deal, but it's not. You know, Kim Jong-un was just back in China again. And of course, the South Koreans are talking constantly to the North Koreans as well. So even though it's not the six-party talks again, uh, there will be a lot of multi multilateral diplomacy that, that surrounds whatever agreements are reached or aren't reached, I think, between the United States and, and North Korea. And it's just an illusion that they can do this somehow mano a mano. <laughs> but, but, but it is Trump, I mean, you know. He's, like, I, I think when they came to him with the uh, proposal to meet with uh, Kim Jong-un, he, he just agreed on the spot. But yeah, sure. Photo up. He loves so, photo ups. Yeah, maybe if, yeah. Uh, Khamenei, no. his wife, I don't know, somebody like, you know, make it enough of a show or something. And yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't bet on it, but you know, it, it is Donald Trump. So uh, let's take a look down the road. January 1, where will the situation be? Barbara? If the Democrats take the House, I think Iran will still be in the JCPOA. Uh, I think the, the JCPOA will at least be frayed, uh, that Iran will be uh, moving outside of uh, certain nuclear restrictions and um, uh, an escalation of tensions across the board and perhaps a tit for tat between Iran escalation and uh, uh, Trump escalation on sanctions. By moving beyond, you mean more centrifuge activity? Yeah, bringing yeah. online advanced centrifuges, uh, reopening Going up Fordo. To 30% uh, or 20%? Yeah, they, I think they might go up to 20% or, or, or bring online advanced centrifuges. You're That's clever enough to stop at 18. Right, 19.75% was the threshold. 20% is the threshold for nuclear weapons. 80%. Yeah. Right. For the, for the yeah, other break. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully, I'll be in Beirut celebrating the new year without, you know, rockets <laughs> flying above our heads from, we probably won't know, uh, Israel, Hezbollah. Uh, I think we'll be at a higher regional uh, tension, just in, in, in multiple uh, fronts and not just uh, Syria. Iraq uh, looks like, you know, things not looking uh, too stable there. So we'll see. Was it Yogi Berra who says it's difficult to predict, especially about the future? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, just, I just don't see President Rouhani being able to make an argument of staying in the JCPOA as, um, as you know, Iran receives very few, if any, economic benefits, but it's always Dangerous to disagree with Barbara, so maybe we'll just wait until the election. Uh, but but you know, watch watch the Israeli-Syrian border, watch the Lebanese-Israeli border. Um, you know, tensions are still extremely high uh, right now, and uh, yeah, and Iraq is is not looking very stable either. Uh, after we thought maybe that election would actually prove to to produce some stability. So uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, Look, it's the Middle East, it's hard to predict, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be less chaotic uh, and less difficult. Oh, but, but you left out future. Jared Kushner's peace plan. Uh, yes, the peace plan. Yes, we're still waiting for that one. Yeah. So uh, look at it this way, folks. Uh, analytically speaking, we're in the game of statecraft. Uh, we want to make sure we have a clear idea of the internal pressures on the respective stakeholders, Iran, Syria, Saudis, UAE, Turkey, Israel, Lebanon, the United States, the EU, China. Is that enough? Um, in varying degrees with, of severity and, and engagement. Because those pressures will give you some indication of what the likely moves are going to be over time. Uh, do we see Iran suffering through and rebuilding the barter arrangements and sort of surviving again over a period of time? And by the end of January, does that 
presage their capacity to continue for another year, let's say, or another two years? If not, how is that society dealing with it? Is still still staying unified around defiance of the U.S. in this case? Do we see the congressional elections giving more leverage to opponents to President Trump? Uh, do we see Bibi, for reasons we can't yet understand, ratcheting up, uh, actually getting intelligence that shows that things are getting worse with Hezbollah, more dangerous, they're moving more weapons in, they're moving more troops up? Uh, do we see the, uh, the Israelis getting more worried about some Iranian moves? Do we see a wild card in Turkey uh, behaving not according to our script? These are all factors that we want to look at and, and keep in mind as we see these, this roiling water sort of continuing to, to bubble over and, and confuse and trouble the leadership in all these countries. And the fragility of each of these countries is really another factor that has to be taken into consideration. All that makes for an incredible um, challenge for all of us as citizens or as decision makers. Um, this is really a tough time uh, because you can see scenarios in each country that will, will pretell or forebode more activities on the, in the region that will pull in these other nations in conflict. It's something to be really worried about as, as we go forward. That's not a happy note to end on. I'm not sure if there's a bright light anywhere in this case for the next six months. France winning the World Cup. Yeah. France? <laughs> France? I mean, I don't know. That's my team. Well, <laughs> you know, it's perverse in a way. Russia has all, always wanted to be a Middle East power, a, 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 an influence on Middle East. I'm not sure they know what to do with it. Uh, but they, they want stability also in a way. Um, whether the ball game will shift to a little more Russian involvement in some respects would be one little minor uh, important. Uh, whether China will restrain its growing capacity to offer exchange and barter arrangements and options for the Iranians exclusive of the U.S. is a very, very strategically important long-term concern. Because the day when the UN becomes an alternative to the dollar is the day when US power is really going to start fading. So we have to really worry about And these are all little bits and pieces in the puzzle that we're seeing. Uh, right now, it's all sp spread apart in pieces, but we'll see how it comes together. Thank you so much for all the wisdom and the You're good welcome. ideas you gave us. Much appreciated.